Welcome back. This week we're discussing traumatic brain injuries, or TBIs, and my guest is Thomas Henson. And it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. I'm learning a lot. It's great being here. Uh, and as we mentioned at the start of the show, you know, this is a topic that a lot of people have been talking about. I mean, Hollywood made a movie out of, uh, out of at least the sports angle of uh, concussions and what it does to the individual. And a lot of states are, are looking at laws, and North Carolina is no different, in, in ways to protect our kids. And I, one in particular is Gefeller Waller. What's the background on that? Well, the background to that, it was actually signed into law by Governor Beverly Perdue in June of 2011. And the, the quick background is that there was a tragic uh, event involving a high school football player who suffered a concussion or a head injury and then was sent to, uh, to return to play much too quickly and ended up dying as a result of a second impact uh, to his brain and to his, to his head. Uh, so as a, as a result of that tragic incident, um, as well as just other kind of groundswell of, of concussion management and, and protection of student athletes, really. It, that all culminated in the Gefeller Waller Act. So, what is that? What does it do for the student athlete? It, it, it really has a, has, I would encourage people to Google it and to look at it. I would especially encourage, obviously, if, if it's student athletes, you know, parents who have teens who are in any kind of athletics or cheerleading any of those aspects, anything where there's a risk of head injury, to Google it and really look into the details. But broadly speaking, the, the legislation is, has three prongs to it. One is education, and these are statutory requirements that schools have to follow. This is not a choice. So the schools have to have systems in place to address three things. The first of which is education. And the education piece involves students, coaches, uh, athletic trainers, and parents reviewing, being provided, reviewing, and signing concussion statements, which are basically in, information forms about concussions, symptoms, what to look out for, what to do in the event of a concussion. So that's the education piece. Right. The second piece is what's called an EAP or, or an emergency action plan. And every school has to have a venue specific, as the statute calls it, um, plan set up for what happens in the event of a head injury. What is everybody's role? What personnel have to be there? What are their specific responsibilities in the event of a head injury? What are the communication channels that need to be in place either between coaches or medical directors uh, and hospitals or physicians in terms of a team physician, those communication channels and how that event gets managed in real time on the athletic field. So that's the second part. All right, before we get on to the third part, let me ask you that. You know, you have high schools all over America. It's one thing to have professional sports, and you see that in the NFL, they have the team doctors and the people who are specifically designed to take care of players like that. How does that work on a high school level? Do they also have doctors and nurses? And I mean, is that not part of sports? Well, the statute outlines the different the different roles that have to be in place for each for a school. And again, right. it's it's venue specific. So there is some discretion in terms of how that is is staffed, but the statute is pretty specific in terms of who needs to be out there. And the most important part where that comes into play is not only on the emergency action plan, but that actually kind of leads us to the third area, which is the return to play and return to learn, as the statute uh, outlines it, of what has to be in place before the student athlete can both return to active play and also return to the classroom. So before an act, a student athlete can return to active play, they have to be symptom free, both at rest and under what's called at stress if they're active, because many times activity will, will spur concussion symptoms to come back. Um, so all of that has to be signed off on by a physician, uh, that the person has been symptom free for the required period of time. And so everything is managed from a medical standpoint as opposed to the way it was done when you and I were coming up or just what, whoever the coach was or whoever the adult on the sideline said, well, go back in, you seem fine to me. Everything now is geared towards protecting the student athlete from further injury um, after they've sustained a head injury. So that's the return to play part. The return to learn part centers around the concept of brain rest and most concussion specialists will tell you or all concussion specialists I know will tell you that the brain is no different than any other part of the body when it gets injured so if the brain gets injured it needs to rest so the student um, is taken out of school for whatever period of time the doctor deems appropriate 
um, taken out of school and they're kept out of school uh, until the symptoms reach a point where the student can be reintroduced at a, at a, at a uh, frequency and at a rate that is comfortable for them and for the brain to start re-engaging. So oftentimes you'll see scenarios where the athlete will go back for a half a day to start and they'll mm -hmm. see how they do. Um, so that really is how all those pieces fit together. It's amazing how far we've come because it, it, is. it really wasn't that long ago. It was basically shake it off, get back into the game. You know, we talk about uh, football, I guess, more often than not about this, but it isn't just football. You kind of alluded to some of the other activities that kids are involved in. What other activities uh, should they be focused in on? Our parents for Yeah, everything. I mean, lacrosse, soccer. I mean, soccer, had, there's been some literature coming out lately, not only with player contact with players running into each other, but just simply heading the ball. Right. Because that is, it may be a relatively minor hit, but it is a ball striking the head. Um, and if you have a player that does that numerous times over practice and in games and all that kind of stuff, um, that can really, that can really start to reach that level of people paying attention to what kind of damage, if any, is this causing. It's just something to pay attention to. Uh, cheerleading, uh, you know, really anything that exposes kids running into each other or, or a, you know, baseball, sure. basketball, anything, anything where kids are running into each other at faster speeds uh, is something to just make sure we're aware of. And it seems uh, in talking with you, you have the first concussion and what is really now taking, we're taking very seriously is a repeated uh, concussion and now I think, is there, if there's not a consensus, it must be very close that obviously like anything else, so you, you break your arm and you go back into it and you break it again, it's going to be worse, right? So we've, we've learned that uh, the, it's the repeated concussion that has the long-term impact on a student, correct? Yeah, it can be, and there have been a lot of studies, and of course there's people a lot smarter than I am who are weighing in on the academic issue of what is, we may have heard the term CTE, or chronic traumatic encephalopathy, right. uh, which is what a lot of the NFL players, what the doctors are finding on deceased NFL players' brains, um, which is pathological, or you can see it under a microscope, damage to the brain that, that, that those, those academicians believe is coming from repeated head trauma. There's various studies that are now being done at the collegiate level and, and now starting to bridge down even to high school age at, at, uh, at some level of thought to figure out, okay, what are we really dealing with here? And that's why you're here today. Well, don't go away because we're going to come back and we're going to learn all about the Brain Injury Association of North Carolina. So stick around.